Welcome to the Greater London Podcast, the podcast that wants to make London even greater. I'm Daniel Koski, your host, and today I'll be speaking to Fred Jones, the general manager of Tier, the micromobility company that's brought scooters and e-bikes onto the streets of London. We'll be talking about how it's made London more convenient, some of the challenges having bikes all over the city, and how the city can evolve its transport to make it even easier, better, yes, and of course, greater for all of Londoners. Please join, like, and subscribe. I hope you'll enjoy it. Tier has been providing lots of the scooters and electric bikes that you've been seeing, using, uh, stepping around in the city. And, and I'm really excited to, to be talking to you today because um, what's happened over the last couple of years in London, but lots of other cities too, is a total change in how we move around, how we, how we uh, go from home to work, from work to the pub, from the pub, dare I say, home. Uh, and Tier has been a, a huge player in in, in changing the, the nature of, of transport in the city. So a huge welcome to you here. Fantastic. Thanks so much for having me. So the first question I've got to ask, Fred, is um, how did you get here? Did you get here on a... Well, I got here, uh, probably like most Londoners, did a bit of walking, did a train, and then, of course, one of our new tier bikes. And you parked it nicely so that people could uh, get around Responsibly, it. Responsibly, in a bike rack, locked it all up. Right, because the, it is an issue. Why it's provided fantastic convenience for people in the city, the truth is also it's providing some problems. So how do you how do you see this whole changing landscape? I think what we see is this conflict of the legacy of how London was built, which was probably around horse and cart and then car. Um, and now this huge shift to scooters, bikes, active travel. But still, most of our city is designed with cars parked down every street, narrow pavements. You know, there's just not enough space. And so, you know, how we try and identify this is, or, or kind of solve this problem is like, guide users, where's the best place to park bikes? Not on the pavement, on the road, working with boroughs, can we get parking spaces where cars used to be and just slowly shift kind of the urban design away from car centric to, to one with new modes of transport. And, th and that transformation is uh, exciting and probably something that'll take a while, right? Because... You know, you said you use the word guided. I mean, okay, guided, but people people don't always respond to being guided, right? I mean, I've walked around lots yeah. of bikes myself thinking uh, I can step around them, but uh, old ladies might not be able to. Well, that, I mean, that's it. I think with, with the new mode of transport, it's, you know, people need to understand what the acceptable norms are. It's really interesting with the scooters. We did some research into user behavior for scooters. You know, how do you drive responsibly, et cetera? And one of the challenges we have with scooters is having two people on one scooter. Right. Obviously not the smartest thing to do, not the <laughs> safest. Especially if you've been to the pub, perhaps. You know. Definitely, if you've been to the pub. Um, and then we kind of got chatting to like, you know, why are you doing this? And like, people say, well, yeah, I saw those guys doing it. And because there wasn't like an intrinsic norm of it should be one person on the scooter, they're like, oh yeah, we'll try to. Maybe also people. because there's room on the scooter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in a yeah. sense, you can't, well, why are you doing it? Because I can, it's sort of the Edmund Hillary, why did you climb Mount Everest? Because it was there. Yeah, yeah. Play again. And then someone does it and they see someone else doing it and think, oh, no, no one stopped so me. So that made you think like, maybe those scooters need to be a little bit more inconvenient for two people. Definitely. I mean, if you look at the evolution of our scooter from, say, the first version in 2019 to the version we've got now, like completely different. The ones we had in 2019, small wheels, no suspension, pretty long footboard. Um, you look at the ones now, indicator lights, big double suspension, pretty short footplate to exactly discourage people from kind of squeezing lots of lots of folks on. Um, really, the vehicles now are, are light electric vehicles um, designed to kind of transport people in a serious way around. It's super so, interesting. It's almost like the evolution of the scooter is paralleling the evolution of the car, except it's happening. Um, not in a sort of 60 year time span, but in a sort of maybe 60 month time span. Yeah, and it's insane. And I was just at um, Park Lane, Hyde Park um, earlier today, where we were doing the first on street testing of this new acoustic vehicle alert. That's right. going on our how scooters. Does, how, does, how does that work? Well, so basically, when we launched uh, back in 2020 here in the UK, one of the major kind of concerns raised about e scooters was you know, from the visually impaired community, which is like, these things are silent. You know, going out on the street, how do I know if one's not coming? Which is completely fair, you know, the same with cars and buses. Um, and so we were like, well, hang on, let's design, as they are with cars, a special acoustic alert that goes on the vehicle that can communicate in like a appropriate way that the scooters come. So you know where it is. So we've done a whole bunch of research with 
UCL, the Pearl Lab at UCL, to develop this sound, um, working with similar folks who developed the TFL London bus. Right, what does the sound sound like? I've got to well, hear the sound now. <laughs> Let me do it. Yeah, 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 do it, do it. So we, so we tested three. It's um, uh, a kind of repeating sort of ding, 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 ding sound. So that's um, really important to help people with visual impairments locate it. And then when it goes faster, it goes ding, 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 ding. So you can tell, locate it, understand where it's going. Also, versus a, uh, so this is getting super nerdy. Now. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Sound. Yeah. But if you kind of get into like, if it's just a, mm, that'll quickly blend into the background. Right. Yes, of course, it'll get lost. Yeah, it'll get lost. It yeah. Just, yeah. So yeah, a load of science has gone into it. This is, so what, these sounds is just going to be present throughout the journey? So what we're going to, once, now we've got the sound, We'll work on it. It's a sort of pre-crash sound. Yeah. <laughs> Those you get to an individual. Jump on. <laughs> yeah. um, no, so we'll work out, uh, you know, once we've got the sound, basically what's the right way to implement it on the street. So obviously having it super high volume, 2 a.m. in the morning in a residential street, not a great idea. So like, can we... Can we limit it? Yeah, can we geo fences? Are there some specific junctions or streets or like Oxford Street where there might be a higher risk or anxiety from you know pedestrians could we have it automatically turn on there you know, during the busy hours and, and that i think you know leads to a really interesting question which is um obviously you're going to try to find technology-based answers to some of the real world problems yeah. you face how receptive is the city the boroughs tfl to a technology-based solution because by definition a lot of these solutions haven't been tried before as you said you've been researching with with universities to get to the answer uh, you know, how receptive you know, is the market? Actually, really receptive, which isn't necessarily always a good thing. So, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll unpick that a little bit. So, I mean, I think one of the advantages of how TFL and the London boroughs have trialed scooters, it's been awesome, like openness, trial and learn, improve, understand that it's not perfect straight away. How can we make it work for the, for, for the UK streets, London streets? The problem is, Sometimes every issue, you almost might think, what's the technical solution for this? Yeah. You know, how do we kind of fix it? Whereas actually, if you kind of step back and look and think, hang on, you know, this is just a new mode of transport. An idiot can ride a scooter and cause you know, bad behavior on it. An idiot can drive a car. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and, and sometimes sure, it's but, like, sure, but in fairness, how can we? Yeah, but in fairness, you know. You've got to have a driver's license to drive a car. Yeah. We've been and biking scooter, for a long and a time and a scooter, whereas a pretty fast paced electric bike or an e-scooter um, mm -hmm. don't require the same. I mean, I know an e-scooter needs, uh, needs a license, but a pretty yeah. fast paced electric bike doesn't. Yeah, no. Um, so the comparison is not entirely fair. No, I guess where I was going is that not that there are risks that we should try and mitigate, more that um, technology isn't the answer to everything. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you need you need some as in you need some human experience and expertise in there. So, you know, to give you an example is um you know, we analyze every incident, every reported incident, you know, we try and understand you know, what happened here, how can we improve, how can we make the service safer. You know, one of the interesting things is the cause of near misses is actually around um scooters and buses. Right. It's Called blind angles or yeah, yeah, right. and obviously yeah, congested streets and coming up the inside, etc. So you know, rather than thinking, how do we get a technical solution to stop that? We said, well, actually, obviously, bus drivers probably aren't aware that there's e-scooter <laughs> riders on here. So what what training can we provide bus drivers to be more aware of the scooters? What training can we provide people jumping on an e-scooter that actually they you know don't hang in the blind spot of a of a bus? So you know, some of the kind of softer solutions as opposed to a technical one. And just coming back to the point about um, how easy it's been to try these things, and you, you know, your answer was it's been really easy. Do you say that because you see across a number of other cities and London stands out because it's more open and both at a, re at a regulatory perspective and at a user perspective, or, or was it more a comment on um, how it is today compared to before? I mean, I, mean, I think it's, um, it would be really easy, I guess, you know, stepping back. TFL, big regulator, you know, run buses, run trains, license taxis. Um, it'd be quite hard, justifiably, to be innovative, agile, open, and pragmatic to learning. So I think it's more that they've really I think it's very generously put by you. Why hard? I mean, I think, I think uh, doing lots of things 
it doesn't mean that you mustn't be innovative, right? I mean, because otherwise you still to Sure, but yeah, different... also, you know, yeah, scooters are a controversial mode of transport, right? Yeah, there's a lot of scrutiny on it. It's easy to, um, uh, you know, you could not want to kind of take on that risk, have an accident, easier not to be involved. Whereas I think they've set up really decent structure coordinated across 10 boroughs and TFL to experiment and try new things. So, yeah, given my history, with with Uber taxi licensing and the challenges of evolving that regulation to new technologies, I actually think this has been like an amazing a lot of learnings. You think? Yeah, of, yeah, of, definitely. Did, you mentioned, um, you know, the you said ten boroughs um, and then TfL, and that really speaks to the complexity of London. You know, London isn't a city; it's a, a city of cities. Yeah, uh, and a little bit, a bit more. Um, how have you found kind of maneuvering, navigating that uh, that environment, that quite complex tapestry of governance? Yeah. Well, uh, everyone who lives in London, like you said, loves London because of its diversity. Like every borough is like a city, and you know, bigger than some standalone kind of cities across the UK. And I guess the the challenging complexity for us is how you respect and adapt to every London borough's legitimate wishes to do things in a certain way. Kind of provide level of parking or you know go slow zones or no go zones and stuff but then also saying well hang on most of us when we're traveling from a to b we don't know when we've crossed between borough x and borough y we don't understand why it's different here and do you think there. there's so, enough cross borough collaboration in order to achieve that uniformity of experience yeah i mean look it's not perfect but i think it's been it's been pretty good uh, and people have been pretty open-minded to understanding like how we how we get that level of uniformity. Oh, go on, tell me which borough has been most forward-leaning. Go on, tell me. Well, look, I tell you, um, Camden has been a, an awesome example. Um, not the only one, but if you're know, one of the big challenges is just availability of parking. So people repurposing, you know, the curbside to park e-scooters, and unlike or, or not unlike most forms of transport, convenience and price are what drive usage. And so, you know, people don't want to walk more than five, 10 minutes to find a scooter sure. when you go to work or something, you want to have somewhere to park it nearby. And, you know, they've got a fantastic density of parking that has, and, and it shows in the usage. It's been, you know, phenomenal uptake, one of the most popular boroughs. And so a great example of how you can really drive mode shift, get people out of cars onto a more sustainable mode of transport by just redesigning the city and the streets to support it. So am I, am I, am I going to get you to say which of the boroughs have maybe not been as Absolutely forward leading? Not. No, not done. Uh, but certainly they should be looking to Camden. <laughs> right, they should be looking to Camden to, uh, to evolve. That's super interesting. Um, we talked a little bit about the, the risks, and I just want to come back to this because um, I was reading recently that there's been an increase in various different uh, uh, you know, reporting in, in an A&E uh, as a result of fractions that people are experiencing falling off, yep. you know, particularly scooters, but probably also, you know, e-bikes. Um, is that is that an accurate assessment of what's happening? Or are more Londoners heading into the already overstretched A and E, or or is it too early to tell and too complex to? Realize? I think you know, with with the stats that have come out around that, I think the the thing that's not brought out in there is the private illegal e-scooters versus. The legal. So there's all the bad from, pirates. You, you guys are would, the good guys, but there's all the other well, look, people. I mean, we, we've got a really good data set yeah. that, that actually kind of track the action. Because you sort of track, yeah, you're tracking yeah, yeah, the action. Yeah, yeah. We, we report everything right. and, you know, we, right. we investigate every oh, situation. Go on, give us some interesting stats then, you know. Do, so, uh, yeah, I do, think. Do people yeah, fall it, off the bikes? It's like 99.9997% of trips on a tier are instant free. Right. So, except know, in the no. hours of, <laughs> no, is it? yeah, it's like yeah. That, yeah, that, that's all right. It's, it's comparable safety to, to bikes. Um, and so, but obviously, if you take the stats of private e scooters, I mean, it's, it's hard because how do you track something that's kind of illegal? Those are often when you kind of see the complaints coming in to, to city authorities, the stats from the hospitals, it, it's people with an illegal private scooter. Interesting. Um, well, and, certainly a good defense. Well, it's, yeah, <laughs> the good, the best defenses are grounded in the truth. But it's, it's interesting because, you know, going back to your point about vehicle design, yeah. you know, just on the roads, yeah, the, the scooters, not just tiers, but, you know, all, all the kind of shared operators. You know, ours weigh 35 kilograms, you know, really large front and back wheels, suspension, indicator lights. Yeah, this is a sturdy vehicle versus you know, something with eight-inch wheels, 
It's an interesting question. Um, maybe we should imagine the future then, because if in the last 60 months, they've already evolved in the way that you described, yeah. you know, what's going to happen over the next 60 months? I mean, the, the sound that you're um, introducing is obviously a pretty, you know, limited innovation. Yeah. But, you know, do you think that the scooter is actually going to look very different another 60 months from now? Is it going to be sort of more encased? Are security concerns going to kind of you know, change the, the actual design and is it going to become more maybe like a small car? I mean, I think you'll, you'll probably certainly see um, some evolution in the form factor, particularly to make it more accessible. You know, so you might see... Um, a seat maybe? Yeah, you might people. have seated and, and in some oh. models you've got a seated ones. In others, um, you know, we've run partnerships where actually there's a variation of a kind of electric scooter that you can clip onto a wheelchair to electrify a wheelchair and, and move around. I also think... You know, part of the innovation at the moment might not look much from the outside, but it's actually kind of the brains of the scooter. Right. So we call it an IoT, which is the device that kind of sits on it. And, you know, we're building loads of sensors in there, edge computing, you know, the ability then for the vehicle to do so much more than just transport people around. You know, can it measure, measure air pollution? Can it? Well, the most experiments I was reading um, that a couple of years ago, there was an attempt at using, um, you know, the free London bikes, the, the Boris bikes, oh, the yeah, Santander yeah. bikes, um, you know, they were fitted with a light and that light also yeah. carried a kind of air pollution, but it proved not to be that useful um, okay. a, a, a method to, to, to collect, uh, you know, the relevant data. Yeah. Um, but, but you guys think that there is an opportunity. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's if you think just kind of s smart city, and data. Yeah, it might be air pollution. It might be something else. We, we're developing scooters that have small cameras on them. You know, that, that can detect anything from, you know, poor riding behavior if you're going on a pavement. But it also, we've done studies in with DCU in Ireland, in Dublin, about, you know, the algorithms to detect things like potholes. And so, you know, if you've got that data set collected for the city, you can actually then precisely understand the state of roads, where to fix it. So there's it. a great story from Boston. I don't know if you're familiar with this, where they um, they offered exactly this uh, this pothole kind of detection system on people's mobile phones, and and the city uh -huh. collected okay. it. And and uh, in, initially, it was said to be you know a great way to see where potholes were. Of course, the demographic of those people who a had the phones, b had the app, and c were willing to drive, and then. A disseminated information was skewed towards a certain social economic group, yeah. which by definition meant that where the potholes were identified were where those people drove, yeah, yeah, yeah. which was not an equitable way of making sure that you're covering all. So I, yeah. there's a sort of, there's an interesting kind of question about um, not, uh, not, not, not being too biased in, yeah. in collection, which is not to say that one shouldn't do it. It's just something to bear in mind. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's, um, I mean, so far, we've done like a, a million, to only a couple of million trips in the UK. So we've got pretty good, but you, we only operate where we operate and only on the roads where we operate. So yeah, there'll be a selection bias in that. But it's a, it's a, a window into the possibility of what, you know, a scooter can go from just transporting someone from A to B to being actually kind of a, a smart city sensor to help, you know, a local authority, city authority, understand a whole raft of it. It definitely is, but I points. think I think the exchange we've just had also speaks to the challenge of boroughs and, of course, you know, TFL and the GLA, um, in that they cannot just take on the information that you provide because, by definition, not just because you're one operator, but also because there is going to be a socioeconomic skew. Yeah, yeah. That information, that data, however rich. Uh, and uh, and better than what is available now is is only one part, and so actually to make full use of that kind of data input, the authority needs to go on its own journey, yeah, in order to kind of weigh that data with other data, yeah, yeah. in order to come up with an aggregate, and that, you know, I think creates a little bit of a challenge because then suddenly the borough is going to ha have to go on a journey of investment itself in a way that they may not have planned for. They need to go on a journey of, uh, you know, education. Uh, they probably need to hire some people that are quite difficult to attract, uh, yeah. given the, the kind of salaries that they command. So so it's not to challenge what you're saying. It's simply to say, yeah. offering something interesting up actually <laughs> can lead to some more cost before you get to a place where there's a... I mean, there's, there's also, it's, it's no good us offering up you know, A, 
someone else offering up B because right. you know with all this. But that then requires that. But then then requires the the the, the council to yes. to say okay, it's this data format. Yep. We're going to ingest it in this engine. Yep. We're going to spit it out like this. Um, and we haven't even talked about the freedom of in, um, you know the the privacy yeah. component, yep. right? And then also, you know, that local authority having the same standards as another. Local right, that's authority. what I mean. You know, data just, standard across yeah, the piece, yeah. and everybody's going to feed in. Yeah. So you know, I'm hugely excited about mm. what's possible, but I think those of us who are excited about these opportunities ought yeah. to just be realistic about what it takes to end up with an equitable outcome, because yeah, the yeah. council, democratically elected, needs to safeguard everybody's interests. Yes. Right? Yeah. 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 I mean, in, in micro mobility, which is kind of the term for you know, pedal bikes, e scooters, e bikes, you know, there there has been, I think, because it's such a new industry, um, there has been some development of things called NDS standards, so some common standards for sharing data. Certainly not there, but it ex does make that challenge a little bit easier. But I kind of acknowledge it's, you know, it's difficult to figure out how to harness this and then move forward with some strategic direction yeah and you've got to start off in the way yeah, yeah. that you have which is you know this is what consumers want yeah. what are the parameters and how can we take advantage of the additionality i just think this if you don't mind me saying so sometimes um from operators that can be a little bit of isn't it just amazing we're giving you all this oh. data <laughs> and and, and yeah. i think you know quite rightly on on the part of the yeah. The policymaker, there's a little bit of like, I think it's great if I could only do something useful with it. Yes. And I think we're yeah. just going to be. Oh, no, yeah, completely. I mean, I think we're, we're as guilty as everyone getting a bit excited about the, the only opportunity, oh, the next new thing. Um, and, um, you know, I think what's really important for operators like Tier is to understand, you know, and stand in the shoes of the local authority and think over the time horizons that and the challenges that they need to make rather than just think, oh, isn't this cool? Let's do something now because, yeah. But let's let's hang on to the cool for a moment, yeah, the, yeah. the future, right? Okay, so, you know, we've talked a little bit about the the, the sort of short, medium-term evolution of the of the technology. But uh, I'm sure it's hard to be in your business and not think about the long term too, you know. At what point are the, are the scooters going to be replaced by sort of jet packs and, <laughs> and, and some mini helicopters that are going to take us from here to there? Yeah. I mean, I think um, in some ways, when it comes to urban mobility, yeah, there's going to be some new, for, cool new forms for sure. But oh, go on, go on, give us well, a little bit. Well, you know, from the back, you know, the, the kind of the flying, the flying taxi, the flying drone. You know that those technologies, autonomous vehicles, you know, haven't haven't arrived as fast as. So, how far thought. out do you think the sort of the the flying the, or the transport human transport drone is? Well, I, I mean, I think that's actually quite a f few years out. I mean, I think the commercialization of that. I think, particularly coming through the pandemic, the thing that is potentially much more near term, maybe more radical, is we just thought about, actually, isn't London streets pretty cool when there's not loads of cars? Yeah, isn't it actually um, nicer when your kids can kind of go out and play in the street because it's it's been closed or it's, you know, it's empty? And so I thought, you know, through that, it's shown the art of the possible. And actually, you know, when you talk about uh, redesigning urban space away from the car, most people are like, whoa, what? No. Whereas I think going through the pandemic, it gave us a glimpse of like, oh my God, actually, this can, this can make London even more livable when we have less traffic, less cars. And, it, and maybe like that's going to be a great spur to how quickly local authorities responded to changing the urban design. Just reflecting but, a bit, um, you know, the way I think of it though is... <laughs> The answer to that depends not wholly, but partly on where you live and how you live. Yeah. And it's absolutely the case that if you live in some incredibly, you know, leafy parts of London with some beautiful eateries that could create very cute outside yeah. space, then of course that is, uh, a, 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 you know, something you'd want to keep permanently, right? Yeah. But all of London isn't like that. And uh, many parts of London, um, you know, are really hard to to get around unless you have a unless you have yeah, a car, yeah. and particularly for older people who might need to go to the GP or the one social club visit. Yeah. And I think, I guess, I think we just need to be nuanced and saying that is absolutely the case. That that definitely made lots of us realize the beauty of the neighborhoods that we live in. Yeah. But there are lots of neighborhoods in this city, and not all of them are that um, are going to be well served by getting rid of cars. Yeah. Well, I think it's. Um... With all these, like you say, it's nuances. You, you could never have one or stream or the extreme or the other. And like you say, yeah, I live in Southeast London, 
And actually, yeah, it's one of those areas of London where frustratingly a car, you know, particularly if you're going kind of east to west, super, super tricky without yes. a car. Um, and, you know, does, does to, Tier um, uh, you know, have, have bikes? In the, yeah, we're, we're, we're expanding. So, um, you know, we, we mainly occupy probably further north and southeast. Obviously, I'm pushing the team to expand and <laughs> expand into Lewisham. Just to get you to and, work. You know, and yeah, exactly. But, you know, I, I, so I live in um, just near Brockley. We've got our main warehouse in Deptford. And it's one of those ones that, you know, in a cycle, I can walk it in about 45 minutes. A cycle, it's a nice 20 minutes there, definitely 25, 30 back on my Brompton because yeah. it's uphill. Yeah. Perfect for an electric bike, but we're just not quite there yet. Do you think that that's the sort of future that, you know, we might have lots of bikes in central London, but then on heavily used nodes going out of the city, there'll be more and more kind of micro mobility offers? Think, yeah, I think so. I mean, when, when you look at the data, um, Generally, to generalize, you know, in the center of London, not many people drive. Yeah, lots of transport options, not particularly pleasant to drive. Car dependency is typically in the outside boroughs. But then for you and I to make a trip across London, you need to have the certainty that you've got something you can use at home, as well as when you're in the center of London for work. So I think we'll see over time a much greater mix of, you know, different modes, connectivity between bikes, scooters, public transport. Um, you know, spanning out into the the outer boroughs, so you can use you know I could use it to zip around broccoli, but I also could use it to yeah get to New Cross when I've missed the last train or get home. Yeah, and you, and you, you just know it's going to be there, and it can be a but that sort of that sort of um, I think they call it multimodal yes. transport. That sort of transport using different uh, different modes, you know, from the from the from the car to the to the, to the bike. Um, it's quite tricky if required, it requires you to look at your phone and access about 12 different apps. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so isn't it the case that the more we move towards that, the more we're going to see pressure to aggregate all that. And the more that there is this pressure to aggregate, the harder it becomes for individual mode providers like you to then position your brand and position your service. Um, I think for some, I mean, in terms of tier, we're all for aggregation. So, you know, across Europe and the US, we're in about 50 plus different mass integrations. I mean, for our business, you know, we make money by people using the vehicle. Um, but they I have, to choose, but they have to choose that vehicle yeah. over some of the other vehicles. <laughs> yeah, but we don't mind if, you know, our, that vehicle is booked through, you know, a free now app, a TFL app. Because you think you stand, because you think you stand out because of convenience, your bike will be the closest to the user yeah so we use our data one part of our big part of our business is using data to make sure that the right vehicle is in the right place at the right time in a fantastic condition so you know when you're kind of choosing you're like oh yeah yeah the tier that's always that's always handily there oh yeah it's in great condition it feels safe it feels reliable so i think outside of you know us having a standalone app you know we've seen great success with our vehicles being made available through third parties um, and I think it's important to, like you say, to achieve those, those goals because, yeah, we want to, there's benefit if someone uses a particular app, say to book and travel by train, Hey, there's convenience. They're like, Oh, hang on. There's a, there's a tier here. Great. I'll, I'll hop onto that. Just talking a bit about the, you know, your model, your business model. I mean, yeah. you know, lots of scooters kind of burst onto the scene, um, in a very short succession, not just in London, but in lots of the cities. Yeah. Um, people had an abundance of choice, no doubt also a variance of quality, uh, and in pretty rapid succession, they won out, but then, you know, there was also a massive contraction. Lots of yeah. companies didn't do so well, you know, left the market, collapsed entirely. And there was a lot of criticism that, um, that, that these models were heavily venture, you know, backed and ultimately yeah. relied on the same three factories in China to produce the, the product. Yeah. Um, you know, how, how do you think the market looks now different than, than that initial vision? I mean, I think it's changed in a couple of ways. I mean, there's some truth to, to the situation you've just described. Um, you know, in the early days, you know, it was frankly kind of wild west. And, and, and I think what everyone learned is actually it's really hard to operate an e-scooter, e-bike company well. You know, you need a really good quality vehicle. 
It needs to last a long time. You need to maintain it. You need to look after it. You need to have all the infrastructure around to do that. Um, so I think there was a bit of kind of natural selection in terms of quality of operator that, that could do that. I think on the other side as well, um, an evolution of cities and you know, getting the tools to regulate um, this well, these these as well. Um, because you know, frankly, you can't have unlimited scooters in a city. There isn't the space. You need tenders. You need to select scoot. You know, cities need to select based on quality. You know, whether it's data sharing, maintenance, repair, integration to mass, etc. Um, and certainly, what we've seen. You know, I look after Northern Europe for ten. You know, what we've seen is is really interesting. The Nordic countries had kind of no regulation. And in the early days, probably over overwhelmed with with operators, you then saw kind of the UK and Ireland be like, "Oh, hang on, that's not right. Let's let's launch, get the regulation right first, and launch first. And now you're seeing the Nordic country goes, "Oh, I see what um, what's working well in those cities. Let's adopt those regulations." Uh, and so we've seen a real maturity of the kind of regulatory environment um, that's gone in parallel with you know, the maturity of operators. That's really interesting. Um, just here coming to the end, this is the Greater London podcast because yep. the whole idea is to make London greater. Yep. So how would you make London greater, both as a Londoner, but also, you know, in, in the context of the conversation that we've had? Well, I mean, I, um, as a Londoner, what do I love about London is probably like most people who live here. I love the diversity and like how every, it's a collection of cities. Um, and I love being able to kind of access and take my family to those. And so... You know, what I would love to do is redesign London with ubiquitous green sustainable transport, whether that's electric bus, electric bike, electric scooter, that's available you know, across greater London, not just the centre. So, you know, whether I'm going from Broccoli to Crystal Palace of the, you know, on a nice day like we had at the Easter weekend, you know, I can go on a, an electric bike and, and just have that consistently across well, that's a very nice vision. Well, Pedro, thank you very much for joining me on the Greater London Podcast. Thank you so much.